All right, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Uh, happy solstice. It is the solstice, everybody says that, so yes. The, the, the light will return. The light is returning. Um, I think we're supposed to sacrifice something to make sure the sun comes back. Um, this evening, we're going to do Siddhartha Gautama and Buddhism. And I thought, wow, that should be easy to do in an hour. Um, <laughs> how to narrow it down, what to emphasize. And I thought, you know, let's emphasize what the Buddha emphasized, because he knew something about Buddhism. Um, and so I really want to focus on those elements of Buddhism that apparently the Buddha focused on, uh, which is uh, uh, surprisingly not what generally gets focused on, actually, as we'll discuss. But to give a little background, I thought I wanted to do two things. One, a little bit about Siddhartha Gautama, and then really compare him to both his time and then sort of what we're used to. So first, he was born. Now, this is a scholastic dispute. When was he born? When would he die? I, I would say the safe thing to say is 5th century-ish BC, so 500 BC right around there. Some say earlier, maybe as early as 560 BC. Some say later, mid 450 BC. Big dispute there, but so go with 5th century BC and call it good. Uh, he was born in, in, in theory in what is modern day Nepal, but was then part of a sort of growing empire in the Middle East of India, of what is modern day India. Of course, none of these things existed then. There was no Nepal, there was no India. And he was born into a culture that was undergoing change. They call it the re-urbanization. This area of India, in fact, much of India, had been urbanized. There were, there were the remnants of old cities that had failed, and we're not sure why. It's something like the collapse that occurred in the Mediterranean during the uh, Bronze Age, the Great Bronze Age collapse uh, that preceded the rise of, of Greek civilization uh, later on in the 4th, 5th century BC. So there was an earlier collapse of civilizations that we can track because of the collapse of the cities in India. In, in Siddhartha Gautama's lifetime, there's a re-urbanization. Uh, the cities are back. Often they were built on the sites of the original cities, um, mm -hmm. often using the bricks and rubble of the original city to rebuild with. So this makes the archeology span very difficult. Um, but this is what's going on. And this reurbanization led to a fluorescence of all kinds of philosophical systems. It wasn't just, not just Buddhism came about, uh, but Jainism, and, and, and which also survives today, and various other religious movements were afoot. Um, and Buddhism is, of course, one of the significant ones to rise out of this. But to understand what Siddhartha is on about, it's important to know what he was surrounded by. And the reurbanization um, led to a return or a re-rise, if you will, of sort of Vedic Brahmanism. In the Vedic tradition, by the way, Indian religious history is vastly complicated. <laughs> Fortunately, we do not have time to do that tonight because I can't pronounce any of the names. But it's uh, the, the rise of the, the original Vedic religion was sacrificial. Think Old Testament Judaism. You took things to priests, and they killed them for you, and that made the world run well. Um, now, this decline, they did a lot of other things as well, but that was really, it was, a, it was a sacrificial, priestly, religious system. Um, in, in Siddhartha's time, that Vedic influence, now this is several hundred years later, uh, if not more, has re-risen. And so you have a, a priestly class that through the in intonation and invocation of specific words and prayers and chants and the performance of certain rituals which emphasize sacrifice but not nearly as much as earlier Vedic religions um, has, has, has come back into the fore. Now this isn't modern day Hinduism by the way, this comes a little later. Modern day Hinduism is a mix of that tradition and Buddhism and Jainism and a bunch of others and that, that sort of give the fluorescence of, of what, what would come to be known classical Hinduism. Um, so, but the way to think about this, or one way to think about this, is in, when Siddhartha is born, when he's growing up in the area he is, your religion and your sort of spiritual life was sort of like a car is today. 
you, we don't know how the hell these things work anymore, right? They're so vastly complicated that you just take it to a specialist and you pray, right? This is what we do. We go, oh God, I hope I trust these people and I can hope they make my car go again. But you don't have anything to do with it. You just make your cash sacrifice and hope for the best, right? And we take it, it's all very much on faith. And we, they say, oh, this happened. And we go, yes, wait, what the hell is going on? We have no idea. Right? We do not know. Do not look in the black box. Great. Right? I mean, unless you know about cars, you're just sort of in a faith-based environment where they say we, they fixed it and you go, okay, they fixed it. We would like your sacrifice. Here's my sacrifice. But it really didn't have that much to do with you. Right? It, it wasn't about you. Now, there was clearly lots of local and regional and, and a, a great diversity of personal gods and uh, and other small family oriented, like some ancestor worship, some of this, but the actual sort of larger religious construct had this notion that somebody else takes care of, care of it for you. Sort of a mild uh, uh, Catholicism in the you know, Middle Ages would be sort of a mild version of this, right? Where the priests do everything for you. You go to the priests, you give your, you know, your confessions and all this, but you know, and the Pope is there to intercede for you. Um, but it was a much stronger, uh, more rigid version of that. R really, they had to do things, and they had to do it in the right way at the right time to make sure everything worked for you. And if they messed up, you suffered the consequences, by the way. Not them, you suffered. It's like if, if you take your car and they don't fix it, they go, oh, well, we'll try something else. They don't seem to suffer at all. Right? You said, oh, more money. They don't know what's going on. Right? Like, ah, oh, damn. And if it gets really bad, you have to go get another priest, right? You go, you just say, well, I don't believe in this auto shop anymore. I'm going to a different auto shop that has better priests. You know, that, so it was, it was much more of this kind of balance. Let, much less personal. You are not that involved. And so as the story goes in Siddhartha's life, by the way, this comes from much later texts, which I'll talk about briefly in a second. Um, he was born with what seems to be upper middle class, uh, not like the, the reigning family or anything. They just seemed to be wellish offish. Um, so he was educated, knowledgeable, and this is probably why he had more access to the priestly class than the average person would. Seemed to be living a pretty pleasant life. Um, and then at some point he's married, he has kids, or at least a son as the story goes. Um, he has an existential crisis. I don't believe they called it that because they hadn't read their chart yet, but uh, they were about to. And, and, and he goes, I, I don't know about this. I don't know if the way this works is the way the world should be. And he heads off on a voyage of discovery, famously. And, he, and, and like I said, this is a time of incredible intellectual ferment. And so there's all sorts of schools going on that you could join. And he tries various ones, most famously the serious meditation, and then uh, the ascetics, the, the, the fasting, uh, the, the you know, putting yourself out in nature with no clothes and no food and no water, uh, I think was where the life is suffering concept comes from. Um, but, you know, that, this, this, you know, he goes out and he tries all this and nothing works for him. And then, of course, famously, he finally says, well, I'm going to sit down at this tree and I'm not leaving until I have my breakthrough. And he has his breakthrough. And the breakthrough, as it comes down to us, is the fourfold path. The, the, I mean, the four noble truths and the eightfold path, which is the fourth noble truth that we'll talk about. Now, I mentioned the literary part of this, that actually, how do we know this? Because nothing is really written down until three or four hundred years later depending on how you depend when you think he was alive, right? So all these dates are very movable. Um, however, what's nice is that Buddhism spread to China up into modern day Nepal, down into Southeast Asia, the Pali tradition. We have Sogdian texts from the other side of China. And these Buddhist groups were isolated from each other. They didn't really have a lot of contact. And then so when several hundred years later they wrote their texts down, from their oral tradition, we can actually compare those. And it turns out that the oral tradition, as this is proven by in many other cultures as well, by the way, is that when you compare them, oral culture really is capable of accurately transcribing texts for hundreds of years. It's really quite extraordinary. 
We don't believe it, we don't trust it because we're a written culture. If it's not written down, then boo, you can't trust it. But in oral cultures, they're perfectly capable of, you know, passing it on for hundreds of years. And so we can match some of this up and we can go, well, this is in every text separated by several thousand miles and lots of big mountain ranges. Um, so probably this is, shares a common origin roughly around the time of Buddha's life. So we have every reason to believe that some of these core things were actually what he said in the oral tradition, even though they do again come several hundred years after he died. And again, depending how many hundreds, depending on when you think he was born. Um, and what has come down to us is a very simple system of, again, the Four Noble Truths, which we'll go over, and the, and the fourth truth, which I really want to focus on, which is the Eightfold Path, which tells you how to live your life, essentially. But before we do that, I want to compare, just refresh your mind on the uh, Old Testament, the Ten Commandments. Because I, I kept encountering all these comments that, oh, this the Buddhist has sort of a shared ethic with Christianity. There's this whole notion of the Eightfold Path and the Ten Commandments. This is utter and contemptible nonsense. This is from people who have never read either Buddhism nor Christian texts. Uh, and just to reinforce this, but also to give you a sense of how different it is from what we've been trained to expect culturally. Even if you're not Christian, it doesn't matter. Our culture has trained us to expect certain things from religious and philosophical doctrines that Buddhism does not provide in general. And so let's take a brief moment to look at the, uh, uh, the Ten Commandments, of which, by the way, there are not ten. And no one agrees on which ten you should choose. But so I just took the King James version, the old. By the way, it's the most beautiful version. So you may as well read the King James version um, from the section of Exodus where people select the ten that they like, uh, as opposed to what's there. Um, so it goes like this: I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. So notice commandment number one, if you want to count it that way. Some some do, some don't. Uh, is about God. It's not about you, it's about God. You shall have no other gods before me. This is about God. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or is the water under the earth. And you shall not bow down to them nor serve them. So this is about not having other gods which seems like a repetition of the previous two, but that's okay. Also notice, this is one of those commandments we absolutely don't follow. <laughs> you almost always see this as make no graven images. That's, that's neatly cutting out all that stuff about making no images at all. Um, you may have noticed we have a culture that does make images. Uh, <laughs> For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting iniquity of the fathers upon the children of the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercies to the thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of thy Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. All right, so we're either five or six commandments in, and they're all about God. Notice you have not entered the picture yet. There's nothing for you to do other than do whatever the hell God says. Right? So this is important to note because it, it, it's strange. Uh, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day of the Lord. Now, okay, there's one. Rest on day number seven. That's an actual commandment that might have something to do with you. Uh, so do no work, don't do anything. Of course, we don't keep that one either, but that's all right. So the Lord made the heaven and earth in six days and rest on the seventh, so so should you. Honor your father and mother. Wow, there we go. One for us, clearly. Rest on the Sabbath, okay, but one for us. Honor your father and mother. Um, don't murder people. That's an excellent one. Don't commit adultery. Okay. Don't steal. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Now, this is important to note that this does not say do not lie. This is literally do not perjure yourself. Everybody knows the difference between lying, which is just lie, and perjury, which is to lie in court. This says, do not lie in court. Apparently, lying otherwise is fine. There's other, there's other Bible passages that suggest you shouldn't lie, however, but not in, the, not in these commandments. Uh, you shall not cover your covet your neighbor's house. You shall not cover your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's, which I think is an interesting list, or anything else. Not ox, not donkey, not servants, male or female. Right, so... Of the 10, 11, 12, however many commandments there are, these are where the 10 are generally taken from, 
about five of them have anything at all to do with you, and they, fo- they are of the following order. Don't, 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 don't. Don't do it. Don't. Bad things if you do, because I'm a jealous God, and I will smite you. Now, the four noble truths have just literally nothing to do with this at all. Um, and I did not, tra- so I, I put them quickly because I want to focus on the eightfold path here. So all existence is dukkha, the number one truth for, of, of the four noble truths. The source of dukkha is attachment or desire, number two. One liberates oneself, one can liberate oneself from dukkha, number three. The eightfold path that ends dukkha is four. Now, I did not translate dukkha because I want you to do this mental experiment. All you have to know is it's not good. You do not have to know what this means for, to understand what the hell Buddhism is up to and what, the, what Siddhartha Gautama was talking about. Here's a bad thing. You want to relieve yourself of it. Here's how you do it. Eightfold path. Buddhism is the exploration of the eightfold path. What's interesting is remarkably little Buddhist stuff talks about the eightfold path. Uh, the, there's a great book, actually a very good, interesting book called What the Buddha Taught by Walpolo Rahula. I believe I got that name wrong again. Um, but uh, Walpolo Rahula, What the Buddha Taught, is a very good book, actually. But he says the single thing that most importantly the Buddha taught and that he spent 40 years of his life teaching was the Eightfold Path. And in a 160-page book, he spends five pages on it. And this is always strange to me because everybody says this is the most important thing and then everybody moves on. So I wanted to say let's not move on because everybody agrees that this is what the Buddha thought was really important. Not what Dukkha means, not all the rest of it. He said he believed it, said you should believe it, but that's not what matters. What matters is the Eightfold Path. And he repeated this over and over again. And uh, there's so many examples that it's, it's hard to choose from, but one of my favorite ones from a later Pali text is uh, one of the first people that had gone to follow the Buddha comes to him one day, and, to, and I paraphrase, and says, hey, you know, who created the universe? What happens when we die? Are we really immortal? And the Buddha says, this is a, these are unhelpful questions. And the student says, well, but if you can't answer those questions, why am I here? And the Buddha says, I did not ask you to come here. <laughs> I never, he, he, and he says, I did not ask you to come here. And did I ever say I had those answers? And the student says, no. And the Buddha says, well, there you go. <laughs> but his point is, these are unhelpful questions. You don't need to know those. The other example is the, is the parable of the poison arrow. A man is shot with a poison arrow. And they take him to a surgeon. And does he say to the surgeon, Wait, 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 wait. Who shot me? What kind of bird is the feather on the arrow from? What region do you think they were raised? What class do you think that person who shot? Why did they shoot me with an arrow? We don't do this. (laughs) We say, arrow bad, help. Please remove arrow. And, and, and there's literally hundreds of parables like this. And the Buddha just emphasizes over and over and over again. It has a metaphysics, but that's Buddhism wasn't, the Buddha was not interested in the metaphysics. He was interested in the Eightfold Path, which says, look, you have a problem. You've got an arrow stuck in you. Obviously, a, an obvious metaphor. Poisoned arrow, actually, which is even better. We've got a poisoned arrow stuck in us. How the hell do we get that arrow out? Answer, Eightfold Path. By the way, I think saying something has four noble truths and one of the truths has eight parts is cheating, by the way. But that's okay. Uh, it, but, but it's okay. But it's okay. So let's go through the Eightfold Path, but I want to keep both the, the Brahminic sacrificial religion and the Christian Ten Commandments in mind as we go through this so you get a sense of how fundamentally revolutionary this sort of thinking is, both in Siddhartha Gautama's time and in our time, actually, it turns out. Um, so step one is right understanding. Uh, by the way, I should note, the Sanskrit here for right is not right and wrong. 
It's not right understanding and wrong understanding. It's more like if you go to the grocery store and you buy a cantaloupe and they give you a tiny bag, that's the wrong bag, right? It's not wrong because there's some moral or ethical problem with it. It's your cantaloupe won't fit in that bag, right? It's an inappropriate bag. So think appropriate. I, try, I use the word that everybody uses, but the Sanskrit word really means appropriate or just, right? And then if you said that bag is too small and they give you a huge bag, you go, well, that, that, bag, isn't, that bag is too big. And if they gave you the correct size bag, you would say, oh, thank you, this is an appropriate bag. But you wouldn't have a moral or ethical like, attachment. You would not say you were going to hell because that bag is vastly too small for my cantaloupe. Right? So, so one of the things we need to do is drain our tendency to load ethical meaning onto these words when they were not used in that way. It's, it's very important to get this. So right means appropriate or just or functional even, uh, as opposed to correct versus incorrect. It, it's sort of the, the Nietzschean beyond good and evil, right? He's like, you just got to get that sort of language out of your mind so that you can see that this is more of an appropriate, useful uh, sense of, of right. So it's not wrong to translate it as right, but it does have those connotations. To see the world as it is and to understand the Four Noble Truths. So the first notion here is right understanding is to just look at the world and just see it as it is and he emphasizes this over and over and over again to if you can just see the world you'll actually be in business this is really all you need but it's hard for us to see the world we bring attachments and justifications and arguments and histories and all of this and it confuses us uh, and generally they tend to emphasize that understanding the four noble truths is part of right understanding which sort of seems implicit, because otherwise, why would you be worried about right understanding if you weren't doing the Four Noble Truths? But they do emphasize that. Um, but by the way, this is your understanding. Notice it doesn't tell you what to understand. It doesn't tell you how to understand. It just says pursue a correct sense of how the world is. And again, there's all these parables that roughly go like this. Oh, Buddha, how is the world? And the Buddha says, I don't know. Why don't you check it out for yourself? I paraphrase again. But this is, there's this continual reference back to the person who is asking the questions. You ask a question, the Buddha asks a question back. Very unhelpful in some ways. Uh, right thought. To think about the right things in the right way. Occupy your mind with purposeful thoughts. So this, uh, they call our brains the monkey brain, which I think is the greatest uh, uh, sort of idea for our brains. Because they lived in a culture, of course, that had monkeys. And if you see monkeys, then you go, yes, humans. <laughs> right? They're, they're, we are just sort of slightly maybe evolved either less or well. I don't know. I can never tell. Uh, monkeys. And, but our minds jump around. And one of these is, is it's, you have to learn to sort of think about the right things. And, and think about them in the right way, right? To, 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 so if you, I'm, I'm trying to think of an example of, of this. If you, if you train, you start thinking something that you know is unhelpful or that upsets you, we'll think about something else, right? And to learn to think about the right things in the right way. Well, what are the right things? Again, all the parables say, does thinking about this help you or does it hurt you? Think about things that help you, and don't think about things that hurt you. That's, you, that's not a crazy talk, by the way. <laughs> you know, this seems like, wow, that's, you would think this would be obvious. But it turns out it's the least obvious thing going. Um, and, and so that notion of trying to get our thinking right. And then right speech. Again, uh, speak the truth. Don't lie. So there's one overlap, by the way vaguely with the Ten Commandments but it's much greater than that avoid gossip why avoid gossip because basically they, they felt this this is going to harm you and harm other people and it's not what you should have in your mind worrying about what other people are doing saying salacious or slanderous things about them as pleasant and as enjoyable as that can be <laughs> uh, you know is this really helping you on the path but the Buddha thought, no, this doesn't really help you at all. It distracts you. It confuses you. It entertains you in a perhaps a very limited way. 
but it probably in the long run harms you and harms other people. So, so avoid that. Don't speak harshly. Don't, don't, you know, say harsh, evil, upsetting things to people. Partly because you don't want harsh, evil, upsetting things in your mind. So then if you can do that, then you won't have this come out in your speech. There you go. And don't speak needlessly. Ooh, that's a hard one. <laughs> Says the person who lectures once a month. Right? This is, this is uh, uh, you know, this is one of those just be quiet, right? This, this endless chatter. One reason that, that Buddhism emphasizes in its evolution uh, monasticism and leaving and going out on your own is simply to quiet us down. It's easier not to gossip about people and say needless things and so, when there's nobody around. When it's just you and the chipmunks out there in the woods, although I guess you could chatter at them endlessly. Uh, but yeah, so that sort of calming. Right action. Now again, notice in the Ten Commandments, we, do, we get all the don't covet everything that your neighbor has. Um, okay, don't kill them. Okay, don't bear false witness against them. Okay, that seems reasonable. But, but Buddhism is, this is a very different tenor. Don't just not do bad things to people, but do, avoid doing that, but also do good things and do them in the correct way. And also, as we'll see, for the correct reasons. But it's uh, difficult to define, by the way, what this is, because it's going to be so variable from person to person. That this, uh, what does it mean to do a right action? You know, it's, it, under what circumstances, to who, amongst... I mean, you have to ponder this. There is no answer. This is part of the problem with the Eightfold Path, is it doesn't answer anything. It gives you a bunch of unanswered questions and guidelines and says, well, think about that. Not surprisingly, a lot of them have to do with thinking. Right? But what can you do that's right? What can you avoid doing that's wrong? And, and of course, right action includes a lot of things like not killing people, but, it, it, but there's this notion of uh, amsa in, in, in the, both the Hindu and the Buddhist and the Jain tradition which really emphasizes do no harm. Be peaceable as possible. The Jains take this very far indeed. Uh, you know, they don't want to kill insects. They'll often cover their mouths so they don't breathe in insects. So, so they, they, they go a long way. But this is the idea, how, what can I do that I don't harm people or create damage or uh, uh, just be as peaceable and, and helpful and sort of quiet as possible? Um, this is, again, not, not our tradition. Right livelihood, <laughs> closely allied with right action. Okay, we have to make a living. We have to survive. How can we do this? Well, avoid doing anything that would, for instance, violate right action, right speech, right thought. Don't occupy your mind with something that's going to baffle and confuse you and lead to bad actions. So they, he specifically outlaws anything to do with, with weapons, right? So you can't be an arms dealer, so cross that one off of your future list. Um, you know, military, not so much. Basically, anything involving weapons or any kind of physical violence towards people. But then it goes much further than this. You can't take advantage of people. You can't exploit them. Um, by the way, the Jains are, the, are some of the most successful business people in India because everybody trusts them. Because their whole religious outlook is we're not allowed to exploit people. We have to do fair dealings. Uh, you, you know, so this notion of, of you know, uh, not harming people is just the tiniest little, like we think, oh, if somebody doesn't punch me in the face, they're a decent person and they haven't done wrong. <laughs> The Buddhism just says, no, that's just, that's good, right? It's a good place to start. But, you know, not robbing them or ripping them off or taking advantage of lying to them or thinking bad thoughts about them. It's just very much vaster, both responsibility and complexity. Um, right mindfulness. Uh, focus on one's mental state 
and thought as a way of reinforcing all of the above. And this, is, this comes under the one reason Buddhism emphasizes meditation so much is because trying to keep your mind in the right place to have the right thoughts so you can speak the right things and speak right the appropriate act is very difficult. If you've ever been tired, perhaps this happened to you, and you've just done something because you were tired and irritable, and the second after that you thought, ah, I shouldn't have done that because I was just tired and irritable. And then we have to spend a lot of time justifying that as if it wasn't just because we were tired and irritable. That's the next step, of course. And then eventually, if we're forced to, we might concede that perhaps that wasn't the wisest course of action. Uh, that, that whole process is what right mindfulness is trying to help us prevent. If you can keep your mind in an appropriate space with the right thoughts in it, then you won't do daft things. And if you do the right actions that help you keep the right mindfulness so that your thoughts are appropriate, then your speech will be good. And if you don't say hurtful things that upset people that then cause you to lose focus on your mindfulness, which then tires you out so that you do stupid things, right? So there's all this big feedback. All of these are, this isn't one thing that you do and then the next. It's all tied together. So it, it, it's, they all come as a big ball, which is hard to unentangle them. Um, and then right concentration, uh, which, I, like I said, essentially here is learning proper meditation. So they, they basically say, look, the only way you're going to be able to do all this right mindfulness, thought, and focus, and everything is to train your mind to do this. It's not natural. We aren't born this way. You have to train your mind. And the way to train your mind is in, in one of the many modes of meditation uh, that Buddhism has developed and then Hinduism has developed over a long period of time. Um, and so that is the Eightfold Path. And again, now think about this, how totally different it is from our tradition. Who is responsible for all of this? We are. If we make a mistake, who suffers? We do. If we do something right, who benefits? We do. Who judges whether what we've done is good or bad, or working or not working? We do. See, there is no outside intervening God, set of gods, priests that tell you yay or nay. It's complete, and again, the, 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 the parables here are perfectly clear on this. The Buddha emphasized this over and over and over again. It's in you, it's you, it's on you. It's your suffering. By the way, dukkha generally translated as suffering or burden or struggle. Um, so the first noble truth is life is filled with lots of suffering. Or at least the nature of that, the fact that life is so transient creates lots of inevitable suffering amidst the joy. And then the second noble truth is that's caused because we get attached to things. We misunderstand the world. We misunderstand ourselves. And then the third noble truth is you can cure this. And you can cure it, of course, by the Eightfold Path. This is the cure. But notice, it's your suffering. It's not God's suffering. It's not somebody else's suffering. There's no threat here either. If you don't do this right, you're right where you were anyway. <laughs> right? And nothing, nothing, there is no, oh, you tried and you failed. If you can fail in Buddhism, I'm never clear that you can. Um, you know, you tried to do something, improve your life, and if you improved it, then your life is improved, and if you didn't, then your life isn't improved. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's really, I mean, it's, it's just, that, that's it. There is no, the, I am a Lord, your God, who will smite you under the third generation. So if I mess up, you're going to kick my grandkids around. That's an interesting kind of God, by the way. Um, but, but no, in Buddhism, he's not going to kick you around. He's not going to kick your kids around. He's not going to kick your grandkids around because there is no one to kick. There's no kicker. It's just you. And can you transcend this condition, yes, but here's how. Um, and so it, it, there's no, but so again, one, no God, no 
arbitrary external rules. It, the reason it says, hey, don't gossip about other people, it, it's, it's almost Epicurean in the sense of the reason you don't want to gossip about other people is it's bad for you. It's bad for them too, and that's not nice, so don't, don't hurt them, but it's really bad for you, and that's what we're working on here. Just, you know, does it help you? No. Well, then why are you doing it? And you must find yourself that. Uh, again, for me, it's, it's always something like a bowl of ice cream. If I eat any more ice cream, I will be sick. And then I continue to eat ice cream. I'm beginning to feel ill. I should stop eating ice cream now. And then I continue to eat ice cream. And then at some point I go, I really do feel poorly now because I ate all of that ice cream. That is Buddhism. Because Buddhism says, hey, you might want to stop eating that ice cream. <laughs> And you go, ah, oh, now I feel terrible. And Buddha's like, yep, that's what we were trying to tell you the entire time, <laughs> right? And that is, it's, it's, you know, it, it's so the Eightfold Path is the method to try to help you from not eating the entire bowl of ice cream. That's sort of the, the uh, but, and it turns out, as we all know, as silly as that sounds, it's very difficult. I mean, not doing things that cause yourself pain, well, sure, hell yeah, that sounds obvious and simple. Let's do that. Oh, we all know how hard that is, right? Haven't, I mean, haven't you had those moments where it, half of your mind is like, oh, this is just going to be painful. And then the other half of your mind is like, ah, we're going to do it anyway. And then you're like, ah. By the other half of your mind, by the way, that's the monkey brain. That is the monkey brain. And you need to train yourself so that the monkey brain doesn't win or at least wins less and less often. Well, the idea is then you'll be better and better as the monkey brain lends less and less often. Now you notice none of this has any great metaphysical argument to it. You don't have to believe anything about reincarnation or karma and dharma, uh, uh, infinite lives. And more. You don't have to believe any of that. It's not necessary. Buddha actually says this. I don't care if you believe it. I'm not even going to talk about it. It's a waste of time. Because you just you, know, you look at that list and you go, wow, um, that's pretty good. Maybe to try and be healthy, make ourselves better. Um, but it's not a popular list. I think this is why everybody immediately moves on. Go, wow, that's a very nice list. Let's talk about questions of immortal transcendence and multiple lives. Thousands of pages of books written on that, which is fascinating, very great subject, you know, but, but yeah, but, but the Buddha's like, hey, but no. Because see, this is, stuff, this is what we don't want to talk about because this has to do with us. It's, it's on us. This is, see, the, the beautiful thing about the Ten Commandments is I have four things I can't do, most of which I hope I wouldn't do anyway. Right? I might do some of the coveting thing. All right, I'll grant you that. But I probably wasn't going to kill anybody. I like to think I wasn't going to kill anybody anyway. Even if you didn't carve it in a stone, I like to think that. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I will kill somebody. But, you know, probably not. I'm pretty clear on the lying thing. Try to avoid that as much as I can. Certainly perjury. Too terrified to do that. I'm just a coward. Uh, you know, so, so this list is really easy. It's a great list, because who, how much of us are we going to do? Besides the covet thing, which we don't follow anyway. Uh, because nobody can tell, right? That's the great thing about coveting. <laughs> right? Isn't that right? I mean, this is, this is the beauty of covetousness, is you can't tell, so I don't even care about that one. Um, and so, yeah, what an easy list. Six things about God, three things that I have to do that I wasn't going to do anyway. <laughs> Jackpot, what a great religion. This really works for me. Not so much the one that says, hey, would you like to make your life better? Well, weirdly, that's the one that we struggle with. Wouldn't you like to make your life better? In theory, yes. In practice, boo, not really. Thanks for asking. Pass the ice cream. Right? It's, it's, I mean, it's just that it's bizarrely challenging to want to improve our lives. We like things that say, you're going to suffer eternally in hell if you don't follow this list of very simple things that any stupid person could follow. <laughs> Thank you. But we don't like the list that says, look, there is no punishment except for the way you live. Ugh. I already know that. <laughs> right? To tell me something I haven't experienced. Let's talk about that immortal transcendent multiple life thing again. 
Um, and, and so it's, a, it's, an inc it's just totally different from our expectations. By the way, it was totally different from the expectations of uh, the Brahmanic class at the time. This is a big threat to them, by the way. Because if you say, well, if, I don't, if you don't bring me the sacrifice and I do the uh, horse sacrifice would be the big one. It, it pretty much died out by the time Siddhartha Gautama was around, but that was the big Vedic sacrifice. I mean, that was, if, if you were doing something like at the end of the year, this is what the king would do to make sure everybody in the kingdom was great. But if we don't do this in the right way, and somebody comes along and says, well, you don't need any of that. That's totally unnecessary. You just really need to focus on you and what you're doing and, and, and how you influence the people around you. Well, you just put a bunch of priests out of business, and they do not like this. <laughs> They've never liked this. Uh, and, and so if, if you read the Bhagavad Gita from the Mahabharata, part of what this is is an argument against Buddhism because it was such a threat to the Brahmanic system that they're like, ooh, we have to come up with an argument that you know, says why you, this is wrong. And so when the, next time, actually, we're going to talk about Vyasa and, and the Mahabharata. Um, and we'll talk about this very aspect because it's so crucial. Because it changes the entire dynamics of your religious system. In theory, although not in practice, you can't have priests anymore. You can only have sort of guru-type people who sit around and don't tell you anything. <laughs> Right? You know, you ask me a question, I'm just going to throw it back at you. Ask me, I'm going to throw it back at you. Um, the notion of like training and meditation, you really theoretically can't meditate wrong. You can only meditate less well than you should. And since other people can't actually access your mind, it's hard to tell whether you're doing this well or not. And so they've come up with all these proxies, but what they really are is sort of they become meditation competitions, as I like to think of them. Oh, I can sit Zazen in a frozen monastery for a month with no water. You know, that's not on the eightfold path, by the way. You can read it a bunch of times, and you'll never find frozen monastery, eight months, no food. Uh, because it's not there. And it's not there because it's silly. Um, because, you know, training your mind is good, but that's not the goal, of course. Um, and so this huge challenge was popular. It's so popular that Buddhism is one of the largest religions in the world today, depending on how you score, you know, 500-ish million followers, which is really good when you consider China doesn't really allow religion. And so if, if China ever sort of loosened up a little bit, I think we might discover there was a, a few more, you know, sort of secretive Buddhists in China like 500 million or so. Uh, but, you know, that they're, they're, they're out there. But, but, so, no, but it's still a huge religion. It's spread all over Southeast Asia, hence all the polytexts. Um, it spread into Tibet, of course, and then it spread into China, and then it spread from China to Japan. And then it spread sort of from J China and Japan into the United States and Europe. And, the, and so that's, well, that's a, what, 2,500 years history, really quickly there. Um, so, but what's happened in all that time is Buddhism became every possible thing. And this is why I want to go back to the Four Noble Truths and the, particularly the Eightfold Path, is because what we've inherited as Buddhism is this unbelievable buffet of possibility. You just get a tray and you can shovel as much of whatever you want anywhere. <laughs> And you, it, 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 it's every, it's, it is, it's, it is the fill in the blanks, it's everything for everybody under all circumstances. You have the diamond heart Buddhism, which says if you, if you uh, uh, there's this heaven, essentially, the diamond land, and if you say the right sort of chance, you go to the diamond land heaven when you die, which is really not very implicit in the noble truths or the eightfold path. There's the Amida Buddha notion, which is if you just repeat Amida Buddha, Amida Buddha, Amida Buddha, when you die, Buddha, himself a god now, comes down and saves you, and you transcend to heaven. Again, I don't know where that comes from, but it's popular. You have Tibetan Buddhism, what the hell, nobody knows what's going on there, an esoteric Buddhist sect. I love the notion of esoteric just means secret. It means we have stages of Buddhist revelation that we're not going to share with you until you pass certain milestones. And what's hilarious about that is Buddha, I mean, the, the text that we can trace back to him as close as possible said, none of this is a secret. Tell everybody, 
This is very simple. I made it as simple and concise as I possibly could. Share it broadly. Became sealed monasteries, esoteric Buddhism. We don't know what's going on. And we're not going to tell you until you come in. Right? It, which is like, that's different. You have monastic Buddhism, which seems in a way reasonable because these, the sort of the Eightfold Path is much easier to follow if you're not in the world. Um, but it's not clear how much of a cheat that is, though. Right? Notice that this has that sort of element of, of, well, I don't have to worry about it because I'm never faced with it, so have I overcome with it or I just not noticed it yet? Uh, you know, it is, it, I, always, I always wonder about that. In theory, you should be able to wander the world and be just fine. Of course, much more challenging. Um, but yeah, so you have the monastic traditions all over the world, all different kinds. Um, you have uh, uh, nunneries, also women. Depending on the culture, women are either really bad or incredibly evil. Uh, I mean, they, they, they tend to come off poorly in the monastic Buddhist traditions because they, they cause you to have wrong thoughts, right? You, you look, you think, you know, if you're a man, you look at a woman and you think, wow, she can make great curry. And that is, you're like, no, stop thinking about the belly, stop thinking about all these other bad thoughts. You're supposed to be thinking about... What's interesting is all of the evidence is that the Buddha thought that it was okay to be married, that it was okay to have a family life, that it was okay to love your family and children. Uh, not only okay, but probably, you know, normal, healthy. Um, that you could still work on the Eightfold Path. You could still try and prove it without having to sort of become sort of Olympic at it. Um, and, and, and the whole notion of becoming Olympic at this is somewhat suspicious. But so then this all the way went down to, to Zen Buddhism, and, which comes from China into Japan and then back in the United States, which is sort of, uh, it's, it's very interesting. It's, it's sort of Buddhism with no Buddhism in it. It's sort of, you know, it, it's sort of zero calorie Buddhism. You know, uh, the notion that, that just somehow the meditation can lead to instant enlightenment, right? The, the moment of, of clarity, which is probably true to, in some ways, but it's again very different from the sort of public, from the monastic, from the esoteric, from the, I know, I have wives and kids, they know you have to be in a monastery, you have to be celibate, right? But, so for Buddhism, you can have everything you want. You just choose. But generally what I find, and when you do the research and look around, what gets lost is, is the Eightfold Path that really the core of it, and what, like I said, the scholarship allows us to track back to what Buddha actually thought was, hey, you're probably not that happy with your life. If you're really happy with your life, you wouldn't be asking questions to someone like me. I mean, this is the first thing to notice, right? If you're a Buddhist guru, people who are like, no, I'm great, I'm good, you good? Great, fine, have a nice day. Yeah. It's, the, it's the people who are going, you know, something's wrong. It's like existential crisis, come on down. <laughs> Here's my suggestions. But don't believe me. Believe you. That's, this is the part we really struggle with. When you look in your mind, what do you see? A big bunch of chattering monkeys throwing stuff at each other, right? Isn't that what you, that's what I see. I'm like, wow, what a mess that place is. Don't go in there. Right? I don't know. Maybe it's just me. Uh, but it's like, wow, what a, just, what a train wreck. Um, and then the Buddha says, yeah, see a train wreck? I got a train wreck. Okay, great. So then, you know, here, let's start. Let's start. We'll see if we can focus on the less train wrecky parts. You know, basically, can we clean some of this out? Throw away some of the crap you're not using. Dust off some of the stuff you think might be helpful. Just sort of reorganize downsize, get a mini house, I don't know, you know, it's, it's sort of just that process. And then when you begin doing that, you go, oh, uh, you know, maybe I don't need this. I don't need to do that anymore because my mind is clear. And again, it's all these feedback loops. Um, the, 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 the precise reverse of this, it always strikes me, is uh, you may have noticed that TVs have gotten very large-ish, if, if you've seen these things. <laughs> And it's never occurred to me that the problem with what's on TV was that it was broadcast too small. <laughs> I, I, no, that really, I, I mean, it sounds funny, but I'm serious. It doesn't seem like the fact that it's too small is really the fundamental difficulty here. But so somehow people are unhappy with their TV viewing experience. I can suggest all kinds of reasons for that. But 
what they focus on is that what I need is a bigger version of this. That will help in some way. And that is a cure. So you run that experiment and you get a bigger TV. Okay, great. Maybe that helps. Fine. Now you've got the... No. They continually grow. <laughs> there is apparently no physical limit to the size of TV we desire. And I can't figure out why. You know, it's, it's, it's like the... the I don't know. It's a, but, that, but this is what we're asked to reflect upon. Is it really the size of your TV that's the problem? If you say yes, the Buddha's like, great. Run that, get a bigger TV. See how that works for you. And then if you think, well, now I need a bigger TV, the Buddha's like, ah, I don't think you're paying attention. <laughs> but that's your business, right? It's you, you have to decide. You have to think about it. And the problem is if we start reflecting, we go, you know, maybe it's not the size of the TV. Ooh. Now, see, notice, and now we're in trouble. Well, well what is it, perhaps? Ugh. Maybe it's the crap that's on TV. Oh. <laughs> All right, then. You know, what's good, what's bad, what makes you feel good, what makes you feel bad. My father, who died recently, used to just sit around and yell at the TV news. And I tried to explain to him that they could not hear you. <laughs> I said, they cannot hear you. Why are you yelling at the TV? And he's like, well, it's so infuriating. And I'm like, well, don't watch it. There's a suggestion. He could not bring himself. He had to watch it, become infuriated, and yell. And I'm like, okay. This seems daft. Well, it is daft. It doesn't seem daft. It's daft. Uh, it, you know, but that sort of, because, but see, that's the hard part, the not eating the bowl of ice cream. It's not, are we immortal? Can I remember my life from a thousand generations ago? Is, is Vishnu really the incarnation of the Atman? All of this wonderful, interesting, beautiful metaphysical speculation, that's the problem. We love that because it's easy. It's the ice cream that's hard. It's the, wow, I know I feel better if I go for a walk, but I'm just going to sit here. <laughs> right? I mean, I mean, just it's, uh, I feel I have a better day if I get up early. However, currently quite comfortable in bed. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we've all had that conversation, right? How long can you talk to yourself in bed about how great it would be if you got out of bed? <laughs> but in fact, you don't get out of bed. You just keep chatting with yourself about getting out of bed. And then at some point you think, well, now I should really get out of bed or I should roll over. You know, and that, that this, ah, right? It's, it's not these huge metaphysical things that the Buddha was talking about in the Eightfold Path. This is a very specific, clear, personal stuff, which is why we want nothing to do with it. And again, is distinct both from the Brahminic culture, which says, hey, don't worry about it. Bring your car in. We'll fix it for you give it back to you, you're good to go. And our culture, which says, here's a clear list of guidelines, oh, by the way, hugely variable depending on your denomination. Uh, some of them say, all you have to do is say, Jesus Christ is my savior and you're good. You say that, that's your golden meal ticket. It's like a meet a Buddha. And I'm like, wow, what a get out of jail free card that is. Do I have to mean it? <laughs> Because if I have to mean it, that's going to be harder. But if I don't, then I'm right there. You know, this is, this is the tricky business, right? But it asks extraordinarily little of us in some ways. And so that, but this only talks about you the entire time. It's a, it's a religion or philosophical system, depending on how you want to score this, that is only interested in you and your experiences, and so on one hand, you can see why this is attractive and why it spread. And on the other hand, you can see why sort of it doesn't spread that much. Because <laughs> for us in our tradition, this is completely baffling. We want people to say, well, what's right and wrong? We want a list. We want somebody who's got more ranking badges to tell us. We want a system of rankings that we can move up in, which Buddha was pretty much opposed to. Because that's what we're used to. That's how our system has always worked. And when somebody says, no, 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 you reflect in your mind. You 
ponder and try it out and see how it works for you. And then meditate some more, reflect some more, focus some more, concentrate some more. And it brings us to sort of one of these amazing aspects of it because the goal of all this, in theory, is, is nirvana. Um, and, and the funny thing about nirvana, and this is the last note, the goal of Buddhism is nirvana, uh, or nibbana, depending on how you want to translate the, the, the language there, um, is to blow out. Right? We always talk about enlightenment, and Buddha is often referred to as the enlightened one, by the way. But again, the Sanskrit word there means wise. See, we use light, light up the enlightenment, right? The uh, you know, this is, this is the notion of you shine light on, you, you uh, clarify, you, you do this thing. No, the blowing out, the elimination. Again, it's one of these things that's just opposite of, of what we expect. You know, what do I get if I'm good? A trip to heaven. No, what do I get if I'm good? You get blown out. Right? You get the great extirpation of all of your dukkha, of all of your suffering, of all of your troubles. And then what happens? Ooh, good question. That's one of those questions that Buddha was not all that interested in answering. Are, are, are we eliminating? Are we releasing? Do you feel better? Do you feel healthier? Is your, is your suffering decreasing? Then good. What happens when it reaches zero nirvana? What's nirvana? This is an unhelpful question. So it's this interesting, but the, the language itself is to blow out, to, to, to cease, to eliminate. And it's generally to blow out a light, so it's roughly the opposite of enlightenment. <clears throat> But it means to blow out essentially the flame of all the shit that burns us up. So we can stop burning from the inside. Right? It's to blow out that flame. But I just the language there fascinates me because it because we, we can't so that you like all the pictures of the booty is always glowing. But you know, really it's he's supposed to be just like this black void. Not that there's nothing there, but that it's it's the all of the flame has gone out. And we think, oh, the flame is going to become maximally bright. Which I think is just, again, is we struggle with this again. Because we, we, want, we want something. I'm doing all this. I must be getting something. And pretty much what it's talking about is cessation and not getting. And getting rid of. You make the TV infinitely small. Right? And, and, and eventually you'll go, oh, I don't need a TV. And like, boom, you're there. That, that may be enlightenment, by the way. That may be all you need. That may be, that, that may be the, the nirvana with Sanskrit for you don't need a TV. Uh, no, that's not, that's not historically accurate, by the way. Um, so, so, yeah, and if, if, so if, you, if you can sort of feel the, the comparison between, on one hand, um, the Brahminic culture where, where the priestly class takes care of it for you, and our tradition, which says we have priests, we have uh, systems, we have a lot of rules that you follow that have nothing to do with you. They're completely impersonal. <laughs> God does not care whether you want to keep the Sabbath or keeping the Sabbath makes you healthy. You just have to keep the Sabbath, period. It's nothing to do with you. It's everything to do with God. Again, the first five or six commandments, depending on how you score, are all about God, nothing about you. To a system which is really completely and totally 100% about you. It's not about anybody else. It's a personal, individual focused philosophical religious system, which is why it's become so diverse, is because there's so many different kinds of people. So, um, so 2,500 years ago, give or take, Siddhartha Gautama becomes the Buddha and gives us this very simple and yet unbelievably challenging set of, of guidelines for how to improve our lives. And this is the core uh, of what's come down to us as Buddhism. So thank you very much, Siddhartha Gautama. Wow.